during this presentation, um, we're going to have a Q&A afterwards. So feel free to put questions in the chat as the, as you have um, thoughts or questions that you would like answered afterwards. I'll keep track of them throughout the presentation and we'll do our best to answer all of them afterwards. And also in the room, we have Miss Elsie Hector Hernandez, founder and president of the Haitian American Museum of Chicago. Hi, Elsie. How are you? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> okay, hi, sorry about that. Um, yeah, hi everybody. This is um, Elsie Hector Hernandez, uh, the founder and the president of the Haitian American Museum since 2012. We just celebrated Happy New Year, everybody. This is our first, very first presentation for the year. So we're happy that we have people following us. We have a great um, plan for you for 2021. So make sure you follow us um, at Haitian American Museum very closely. Um, but I wanna kind of, um, you know, if, if Carlos would let me just lead this for a second, to kind <laughs> of like um, introduce beside the speaker since tonight, but I have my friend Farida here that I wanna say hi to. And I want Farida to say hi to the group so if they could introduce themselves, since this is a small group, we could do that for about a few minutes just to see who's with us today. So Farida, you could give a start, just a few seconds to how you're connected with Hamak and how are you? Cause she's all the way in. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, hi everybody. Well, I didn't know I would introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. Elsie, right? It's Elsie. It's spontaneous, okay? Toujours des surprises avec Elsie. Yeah, I witnessed uh, the beginning of uh, Hammock. At the beginning, I was there in Chicago, and uh, I felt like it, is, it was a big adventure for Elsie. But now I see that it's growing. It's becoming. Uh, important uh, institution, I would say. If, uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, I really miss Chicago. I miss Elsie, I miss, uh, I miss Hammock, uh, Fayo also. To see you, Farida, I just wanted to make sure I hear your voice, not your face, also your voice. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, Samantha, do you wanna say something, Samantha? Um. Just very excited to be here and to hear um, anything new that I can learn about Haiti and the culture and the environment and the history and such of that nature. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Samantha. Nice to see you there. I know you follow us very closely. You're one of our supporters for sure. Um, Brendan. Hi, Brendan. Hi, everybody. How are y'all doing? Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> my name is uh, Brandon Bird. I live in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I am a, a historian who's very much interested in uh, connections between African Americans and Haitians. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to this. I, uh, I'm also uh, on child watching duty, so I may be in and out, but uh, I appreciate <laughs> y'all uh, putting on this program. <laughs> yeah. Um, are you the same Brand Bird who wrote the Black Republic? Uh, I am, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm putting your book in the chat just to, so that everyone can check it out. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I really appreciate this programming. Yeah. His, um, his work covers um, pretty much um, the Black African-American perceptions of Haiti after the American Civil War and kind of like those sort of contradictions and sort of complications in that sort of relationship. So I suggest checking it out. Thank you. Summed it up better than I could. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Thank you, Brandon, for just sharing that. Um, with that being said, so again, I'm Elsie Hernandez, and the host today is Carlos Bosa, who's the executive director who will introduce himself. With that being said, I'm going to go behind the scene because I'm working at the museum and less to do, so and listening to the program as well. So put the questions and Ben and Carlos will lead this um, presentation and continue on. So thank you so much. Uh, I'll be with you, but behind the scene. Bye-bye.
Thank you, Elsie, so much. It's nice to nice to see you. Happy Sunday. Um, but without further ado, uh, today, Dr. Cranston Knight, um, a promised land African-American immigration to Haiti. Um, I'm going to hand it off to him and uh, we'll get rocking and rolling. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to be looking at the, um, or what I'm going to be discussing is the issue from an African-American perspective and those who um, made the journey from, uh, from the United States to Haiti, uh, looking at the, the, the reasons why the movement came into existence, comparing to other movements, uh, which was repatriating African-Americans, uh, which is a, with the colonial societies, moving free blacks to Sierra Leone, uh, also to <clears throat> other areas in Africa, and then asking a question, why Haiti? Um, that with that other African nation being Liberia. So without further ado, because we don't have a lot of time, let me start. And first I will start with a, a short film. So share screen. Year 1824, when Haiti was 20 years old as a nation. Its then president, Jean-Pierre Boyer, sent out a special invitation to African Americans in the United States who were under slavery and living in segregation in that country. The Haitian president's message to the African Americans? Come live in Haiti. Boyer was definitely not the first person to have this move to Haiti idea. The historian Leon Pamphil writes in the days following independence from France, Haiti's leader, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, had appealed to black Americans and anyone under the whip of slavery to come to Haiti. Several historical sources note that Dessalines went as far as paying slave ship captains to bring Africans intended for slavery in the United States to Haiti as freed men. Haiti King Henry Christophe had laws in his royal code offering anyone directly from Africa or of African descent instant Haitian citizenship upon arrival to Haiti. Under Bouaye though, there was a systematic plan to bring in African Americans to Haiti. Bouaye's immigration marketing campaign included offers to the would-be settlers to have their trips to Haiti free of charge, along with 10 pounds of coffee per family. And upon their arrival in Haiti, they were given three acres of land from the Haitian government to settle on, as well as monetary rewards. Boyer hired special representatives in the United States and sought the cooperation of prominent black and white community leaders and abolitionists who would eventually become known collectively as the Society for Promoting the Emigration of Free Persons of Color to Haiti to help make the campaign successful. Boyer had a series of pamphlets published and distributed in the United States explaining what the immigrants should expect in Haiti and to answer pertinent questions that they might have about moving to the island. Boyer sent his own envoy, the judge and statesman, Jonatas Granville, to the United States to meet with white abolitionist leaders and black American leaders to propagate the Come to Haiti movement. Granville traveled to several U.S. cities with high African American populations to meet with leaders and to give the potential immigrants first-hand knowledge about his country. At the time, there was also a Back to Africa movement to the country of Liberia. Boyer wanted to persuade African Americans to come to Haiti as opposed to Liberia. According to Dr. Leon Pamphil in the book Haitians and African Americans, A History of Tragedy and Hope, the first African Americans started their move to Haiti in late 1824, and the immigrants kept coming through mid-1825 from cities like Boston, Baltimore, and Philadelphia. Boyer settled the immigrants mostly in the Ardiboni region of Haiti and in eastern Hispaniola in an area called Samana Bay. 
Boyer gave them the promised acres of land, hoping to make them into an agricultural community. Some of the immigrants were content with what they found. One African-American immigrant writing about moving to Haiti wrote back to his folks in the USA. Having been a resident for some months in the island of Haiti, I am fully persuaded that it is the best and most suitable place for residents which Providence has hitherto offered to emancipated people of color for the enjoyment of liberty and equality with their attendant blessings. Others not so much. Some found it hard to adapt to their new surroundings, like this African-American immigrant. It was a very common thing to see the Haitian women washing their clothes, men and boys bathing, and horses being washed in the very stream we drank from. This alone was enough to create sickness. And this one, he said. The natives, male and female, generally go half-clad bordering on nudity. The women wear turbans on their heads and do not seem to have any uses for hats. The men always go armed. Out of the estimated 13,000 African Americans who came to Haiti in that period, less than half actually stayed in Haiti. The majority of them, noted the historian Leon Pamphil, returned to the United States. They were middle-class tradesmen, and Boyer's plan to mold them into farmers and laborers in a new land and in a new culture hit a stumbling block. Benjamin Hunt, one of the African Americans who successfully settled in Haiti, would later say of Haiti's Black Americans immigration movement. I call to mind but 13 Americans of African blood who have been what might be called successful in that country and several were of this number were moderately so, and all of them were men of color or mulattoes. Unsatisfied with the results of the Black Americans to Haiti movement, Boyer would stop the full-scale immigration program in late 1825. Future leaders of Haiti like Faustin Salouk and Nicholas Farb Giffard would also spearhead similar movements in Haiti in later years. Historians note that those leaders learned from Boyer's mistakes and were able to make the African-Americans to Haiti movement more successful in their time. Tune in next time for another edition of Queerlicious.com presents Haiti History 101. Queerlicious. to share a screen. Okay, I hope, uh, first of all, do I have audio? Can you hear me? Yes? Okay, good. Um, I hope you found the film interesting. It was pretty hard trying to find that film interesting enough, at least finding a film that I thought was gonna be representative enough to discuss all the complexities <clears throat> of people immigrating from one place to a next. So we're talking about individuals who in, in many ways were skilled artisans going from one place to, an, to another. And, and that was one of the reasons why things didn't work out so well. What becomes really important was the issue of why they wanted to leave in the first place. And um, the issue of free blacks in the United States had been historically a problem. And what many people don't often realize was how many free blacks there were. There were a tremendous number at one point, as you can see in, 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 the, in the PowerPoint here, uh, by 1790, there were as many as 300,000. You got 300,000 free people, particularly in the South. The fear by slave owners that they could incite riots or that they could incite rebellions was a tr was tremendous fear. And they really feared that these individuals 
particularly after Haitian independence and, and that particular movement, and also with the movements which were taking place in the southern part of Mexico to free themselves from the Spanish, there was a real fear that these individuals would be of, of, of considerable aid. And so what they did was they decided that they would never be able to integrate into society because of, they were racially inferior. And the question then became, what do you do with them? And they decided the best thing was to move them out of the society. In fact, move them out of the United States so that they would not become problematic. And with that, we get the American Colonization Society. And this society, which was made up of any number of what was considered to be philanthropic individuals who felt that they were working on the behalf of, of African Americans. And there were also African Americans who were part of the, uh, the Society for Colonized People, Free People of Color of America, felt that they were never ever going to get a fair shake in the United States. And so the United States decided that there were two African nations, one being Liberia, the British era being Sierra Leone, that they could repatriate people to. And so there was a big series of movements by individuals, very prominent individuals, who were discussing the issue of how do we get people, these free people out of these, this particular area, get them board ships, safe passage, and then get them to Liberia or Sierra Leone. <clears throat> and that's pretty much what I have in this one. Um, they were chosen take, to take the excess population. They were needed to stop rebellions. They were needed because they did not, and particularly for those who were a lot, well, the whole society was race conscious, but particularly for those who were more race conscious, there was a real fear that there would be children born of relationships and those individuals would be not only inferior, but mongrels as, they, as the term was used. And so there was a real fear of race mixing. And that was almost more frightening than the rebellions. And people um, had, would speak to each other with watch your daughters, watch your wife, watch the, this whole, the whole issue of the black body and sexual, um, not only relations, but the issue of, uh, of violence was huge in, the, in Southern areas as well as Northern areas, they have to go. So by 1820, you begin to have ships which are at the docks and they begin to take people to uh, the two areas which I spoke of. What also comes up is Haiti. Everybody doesn't want to go to Sierra Leone. Everybody doesn't want to go back to Africa. But people are very aware of the fact that Haiti does exist. And they're very aware of the fact that here's a place where there's been a very successful rebellion and where there's actually a black government. And for those individuals who had never known governance, for those individuals who had always been under the, the, um, the, the lash or were living in very segregated societies to be free, Haiti offered that alternative, a free society. Interesting enough, the idea for sending a slave for Haiti was, was, was born much, much earlier. Uh, as I have here, Thomas Jefferson by 1801 was already discussing and sending individuals and writing, in fact, he wrote to Susanna Loverture that um, he wanted to send the blacks of, and who were living in Virginia, free blacks in Virginia, to, to Haiti. So you get very early on in, in, the, uh, in the writings, individuals saying that we need to relocate people. Um, but as the film notes, and as I note here in this particular text, um, Toussaint and Desilene were already on board to launch a program for the relocating Blacks to Haiti. So you, on either side of the Atlantic, you have those in Haiti who said, hey, we need to get people here because the rebel, after the revolution, there were so many uh, people who had uh, departed uh, the Haitian nation. And on the side of the Americans, you have many who need them to be relocated someplace. And here's a place that says, hey, we'll take you. And Jefferson says, great. This is a great place to send those free black individuals who exist within our society and are not held as slaves.
among blacks themselves, people began to organize. And this whole issue of being free was just, it was tantalizing. It was, they were overwhelmed with, their, with the possibility. So they created the Haitian Immigration Society of Colored People. And these individuals um, began to gather money. Um, they themselves also began to publish pamphlets saying why it was important to go to Haiti, why they were going to live a much better life if they arrived there, uh, what life would be like not being under uh, constant watch by slave patrols, of not always having to pass, of not having to deal with segregation, along with the fact that Haiti had also produced pamphlets. So you've got a tremendous amount of if to, to use a better, uh, not to use a better word, but to use a great, great word, media, that's showing pictures of this lavish place, this place where it's a Garden of Eden, a place that's much different than the one which they're currently dwelling in. So by 1824, you begin to get uh, Blacks, or they're not, people are not known as African American, they're known as colored or Negro in those times, uh, leaving the United States headed towards Haiti. And so by 1824, you have, you know, you begin to get half ships leaving and you get 6,000. Because Haiti had said that they would pay some of the costs, um, those who were part of the society had raised money. And they're also, for those who were abolitionists, had also raised money. So there was plenty of money for ships. They want to have uh, at least, at least on the American side, they want to have at least three months worth of money for and provisions for individuals who arrived there. On the Haitian side, they also was willing to grant land as, as discussed in the film and everything looks like it's, it's all good. It's, it's definitely more than they had and most certainly the future looked extremely bright. The first group that went and there's, there's a couple of movements which do go to Haiti. This first group that goes are coming from not the South, but they're coming from uh, the North. New York, Baltimore, Philadelphia. Um, we know that um, Freeman in New York and in these particular era, ha areas had a different form of um, freedom than in other areas of the United States. There was a very good book called Slave in the Cities um, that discussed the fact that those who moved into Northern areas had slaves in places like Baltimore, uh, in places of Philadelphia. They did have slaves, but they lived in air in a house right next to the major house where they did work. So they were the iron workers. They were skilled crafts people. They were uh, they made uh, symphony instruments, uh, violins, violas. They were highly skilled individuals. So this skilled uh, labor that's leaving is without question still looking for a better place than the one that they're dwelling in. The problem with the first immigration is once the people are there, it's, it's much more tropical. They're coming from a place like Baltimore, New York. It's in the north. It gets cold in New York. The, the area was so different in the, if we talk about climate, than what they were used to. It was much more humid. Uh, it was hot. People became sick. They weren't able to, the society in the North and some of the Haitian government was not able to sustain them in terms of the amount of money that they needed in order to provide, uh, provide provisions and to keep them in, enough substance so that they could continue their lifestyle. And as a result, many of them began to leave and they came back to the United States. So that first vision of going to a new world wasn't that it wasn't a good idea. It wasn't that it wasn't a great idea. It wasn't that it wasn't even a grand venture. It was something that they were not prepared for the environment that they were going to enter into. Oops, sorry. Um, what you have is 
individuals after they came back as we moved through the 1830s, 1840s, you begin to have a lot of individuals who begin to talk about going back to Haiti again. And these individuals who were frustrated with the U.S. government because of the, the white, white supremacy movement, particularly the Klan, which were moving also into the North, um, political leaders like Martin Delaney, um, James Haller, all these individuals and white radical white abolitionists, these individuals are also discussing going back to Haiti, including blacks from the United States who are going to Canada. So the whole issue of going back to Haiti now takes a second stage and people begin to talk about going back. So you had your first movement, now you have a second movement that's going to take place. Haiti plays such a major role in uh, the African-American development in terms of this radicalism. So like Gabriel Prosser, Demar Vizzi, Nat Turner, all of them discussed the issue of Haiti as that revolutionary place where Blacks fought, where Blacks died for freedom. This is that place. And they saw themselves in an embodiment of a Toussaint Louverture. Um, the first uh, individuals who are discussing diplomatic relationship and Haiti having diplomatic relations with the United States were done by free black northerners. They were in position um, to bring to the forefront, particularly in their churches, a movement that Haiti should be accepted as a free country. And they did. Uh, they wrote pamphlets, they wrote letters, there were a few marches, there was a real interest in making Haiti that free nation that embodied freedom. Black abolitionists before the Civil War, uh, David Walker's appeal, which, which was uh, highly, I don't want like to use the word inflammatory, but definitely one that sought freedom. These individuals discussed um, the whole concept of revolution, the whole concept of throwing off the yoke of slavery, that they had a right to rebel, they had a right to have independence, and some, in some cases even having an, a black state. No one at this point is discussing going back to Africa, going to Sierra Leone, or going to Liberia. But they are discussing the issue of rebellion, and they are discussing the issue of revolution. And it's found in many of the writings and the newspapers of the time. They named it a righteous revolution. It is a righteous rebellion. It is righteous to be free. And they sought their freedom. And Haiti becomes that place that has those revolutionaries. Toussaint Louverture literally becomes larger than life. After the Civil War, you have a, your second movement to Haiti. And that second movement, you begin to get individuals from the South also going. Uh, because by 1856, um, you get tremendous amount of violence in the United States. Uh, 1856 was probably one of the most violent eras in the United States history with large numbers of individuals being uh, just killed outright. The South developed the, the concept of, of, of a nation lost. They held on to that, that they had not lost the war, but it had been stolen from them, that they had a right to rise. And that this, this narrative um, was pushed in some parts of the Senate. Um, Johnson, who was the president at the time, pushed this narrative as well. And so you have the rise of the Klan, you have the, the rise of many white supremacist groups. And once again, they were killing large numbers of African-Americans throughout the North as well as the South. And people were searching for a way to get out of the United States. And Haiti then comes back up again. And people begin to say, you know, we need to find a place where we can go such that we can be free. And more importantly, where there isn't the type of violence that we are contending with here in the States. 
That doesn't mean that those individuals who in the states did not fight back, they did. You had many Union soldiers who had fought in um, the Union, uh, African-Americans who had fought in the Union military who did fight back. So you do have in some places almost a racial, uh, I would like to use the word war, but you most certainly had clashes between black, former black troops, former Confederate troops, uh, and so the, 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 the arena in which they were living in was less than congeal. They wanted to go someplace where they could build their own nation. So they began to leave the United States once again, and that's both North and South. With the rise of Jim Crow laws, even those um, that didn't have the laws but did have segregation in the North, there's little to, to no room to wiggle. And so these individuals, felt commonality with those individuals who were in the South, those in the South found a commonality with those in the North. And once again, they begin to look at that particular special place where Blacks had achieved independence. And of course, that was Haiti. Uh, to sum up, it was very difficult in both the first and the second movement to Haiti for assimilation. Um, and it's, uh, it took me a little while to try to figure out what was going on and why was it that people weren't successful in going to the place, primarily to that particular country, primarily because they were given land. And so I had to look at the difference in culture and language. Uh, as it states here, some nations of Haiti is a Francophone. Uh, they were Catholic. Tropical culture provided extra difficult for English-speaking Protestants. And I think many individuals forget just how Protestant many, if not most, African Americans were, and anti-Catholic. You did have Black Catholics. Um, there's a huge Black Catholic movement which takes place even before the Civil War. Um, and, and in fact, there's an individual here from Chicago who was up um, for canonation. Um, he was a he was born into slavery and became a priest in Chicago and um, eventually um, he became the first Cardinal. And once he passed away, uh, his, he was forgotten about until about two years ago. Um, so you did have a Catholic movement, but most people were Protestant. So going to a place that was Catholic, going to a place where people spoke French versus English, that was extremely hard on them. And that was one of the, the, of the major reasons why both movements did not secede, that did not lessen uh, their affinity to Haiti, but it does show why both movements did not work as had been planned. In finality, what I have here, because we're, we're running out of time, is just a reference list. I'm not sure, I tried to make it larger, unfortunately, making it larger, it took it right off the page into the next page, so just a small, I'm hoping that um, I can send out this um, to make it available perhaps online for anyone who wants to look at any of the references or look at any of the issues which I discussed. And with that, uh, I'm sure there's people who have questions. I'll turn it over to Ben. You are muted. I don't know. Who's the, who's muted? Who's muted? Ben is muted. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Well, we don't have any questions yet, so I'll get things started off. Hopefully, that will encourage people to start putting questions in the chat. So, uh, my first question is: Okay, um, you mentioned a lot of these um, African American migrants were from a professional sort of working class. Basically, you mentioned that they were iron workers and so on and all that stuff. How did that influence their choice to migrate or whether or not they could actually afford to migrate in the first place. And they're, and I'm assuming that it, because they were from these sort of professional backgrounds, they were able to read and they had access to literature on Haiti and all that stuff. Like what was that sort of impact on their decision and what motivated them to do this? Oh yeah, they were literate. They were, they were quite literate. Um... Many had gone to schools that there were a number of schools which had been set up 
and 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 individuals learn to both read and write. Um, some spoke a number of different languages, particularly Spanish. Um, what motivated them? You still had a Jim Crow system, and their freedom of movement was still restricted. They wanted to go to a place that would allow them to hone their craft and to also play out their craft. So that motivation was we want to be free people because we're still living under a Jim Crow system. Yes, we're freer perhaps than those who are in the South. In fact, there was an old joke. And that joke was, yes, you could be free in the North, but you could starve or you could live on a plantation and you could eat. And that was um, um, talked about quite a bit. So yes, you're free, but you know, your possibility for having a job isn't very king. Um, or you could live on a plantation and you won't starve. Okay. All right. Um, now, now, you also mentioned that a lot of these people all... You also mentioned... Um, Renee, you want to ask a question? Okay. No, no. Okay. All right. So uh, as a follow-up question, uh, you mentioned a lot of these people came from like the North and all that stuff. Do you think the um, coming to a place that was known for being very rural and very agricultural versus say someplace that was kind of in the early stage of the industrial revolution might have influenced their decision to return back? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. They had choice. The, the choice for a lot of individuals, they were very well the, uh, the individuals who were going to Sierra Leone and those who were going to Liberia. They didn't want to go back to Africa. So as many as the, the, the back to Africa movement that we would see that would take place under Marcus Garvey uh, didn't hold as much, it, 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 as much latitude with them in those early years as did going to Haiti. One, because it was a free nation. Two, they had read hordes of literature. Uh, either had, they had read it or they had heard it in church. So at many of the sermons, the ministers, and there were a number of ministers who had traveled to Haiti, uh, brought back the good news that there is a black nation which exists whereby you can be a free person whereby you don't have to be under, uh, the, under the yoke of this, this um, semi-Jim Crow system. And you can have life as you like it, and you can develop it as you like it. And so that was a, a key point in spurring people on to leave, and particularly when someone else was helping you. So if I'm giving you, I'm saying, okay, you can leave, and I'm saying, but I don't have enough money, and I'd say, but I'll give you, I'll give you three months worth of provisions so that you can get there. In fact, I'll give you free passage aboard a ship to get there. And then once you get there, you've got land. That's very attractive. Okay. All right. We got a question in chat. Okay. Um, what sort of jobs did people, people have when they went to Haiti? Where were their um, jobs in the work they did in the U.S.? And were employers hire artisans or did they start their own businesses? Okay, um, what type of jobs did they have once they arrived in Haiti? Yeah, what kind of jobs did, oh. did, did, did these migrants take on? Did they like became farmers, independent homesteaders, or did they try to seek these sort of professional um, middle, middle class sort of jobs and all that stuff? Okay, um, what was needed in Haiti was agriculture. Mm -hmm. And so they... Who, those individuals who arrived were expected to take an agricultural role and they just weren't. They were iron workers and iron worker isn't the same as someone who works agriculturally. They knew very little about agriculture. Uh, they may have had a small garden, but that's not the same as working in, in, or, or using a plow. That's not the same as using a mule or some other animal to um, help till the land. So in that sense, they were useless, to make a long story short. Uh, you're, you, you, you make violins or violas. Uh, you can't use that same skill in a place which had just had a revolution and now is trying to rebuild itself. So Haiti is trying to rebuild itself. And these are individuals who are, are skilled, highly skilled in a very specific area. 
that has no place in a country which, is, which has just gone through a revolution. So they were, they were ushered into this, this uh, unskilled labor area and they, um, they unfortunately didn't do very well. Okay. All right. Um, we got uh, another question. Um, to what extent are, are these expats today in Haiti? And what extent are they involved or have been involved in the politics of the nation? Are you talking about um, the African-American population? Yes, uh, the African-American population today in Haiti. Oh, uh, for those who stayed, they assimilated. That there, there, were, there, were fair, there were over the two um, um, groups which went and then over subsequent years that people have gone to Haiti to live, um, they're probably in every, and, and this is more of a something than anything I can put my fingers on. I would assume they're in uh, every aspect of Haitian society. Okay, so they're just as well integrated as say- like, Just as well yeah. integrated, right. Many stayed, they're not, there, was a, there, there was a critical mass that stayed over a period of time that integrated uh, into, the, into the society, married into the society, and learned French, um, and grew with the society. Okay, so you're saying they're just they're just as well integrated as say like a they're just as well American integrated, right? They're just as well integrated as um, as so other groups who've gone. Say so, say when we talk about the, the the individuals who are Polish or German who wound up going to Haiti, uh, you know, one after one who after the 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 the, the Poles after the um the, the Polish soldiers who stayed integrated into the society. Mm -hmm. Um how much friends did they know? I have no idea. But did they stay and eventually learn it? Yes they did. Did they integrate into society? Yeah, they did. And that was also true for the Germans when they eventually would come. Um, and in the beginning they're very skilled. And but did they know the language? Some knew French, some did not. Did they were did they did they eventually integrate? Yes. So extrapolating from that, the quite and looking at African Americans, yeah, they eventually did integrate into society. Okay. Okay, so we got two questions. I'm gonna skip one real quick, so because it relates a little bit more to what we were discussing. Um did these um American Haitians within Haiti identify themselves as Americans? Ah, that's a good question. Like, um, like, is there like, say, I don't know, like a version of Haitian American pride in Haiti? Haiti? Yeah, that, no, that's a really good question. Um, I can only assume because I've not read, so I, I can't, I haven't read anything substantially on that. Um, I can only assume that somewhere in there would yes they identify as Haitian and but they do also understand the fact that they have an American root. Uh, it would be like any series of immigrants from any place else that would say yes I am uh, in the South of Needles yes I'm in the United States but I'm Irish if you look at my if you look at roots. So I can only assume that those who are, who, who stayed um, keep up with some of the things which are going on in the States, maintain some, um, some type of uh, relations with the African-American community because you're not that far from New York. Um, you're not that far from Boston, Baltimore, uh, and, and particularly now as you've had Haitian communities develop in those areas, uh, it would be very easy to see yourself as Haitian with an American root. Um, I, I, I can't say for sure because I've not seen it, but I wouldn't be surprised if there is a French English uh, newspaper that exists in Haiti so that people can have some idea what's going on here in the States. So right. that, that wouldn't be surprising at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, um, another question. Um, when these migrants came here, were these uh, American Blacks guaranteed quick, easy access to citizenship when they arrived in Haiti? They were never, <clears throat> excuse me. The issue of citizenship, as far as I've, I've seen in the research so far, um, they were going there to find a better life. They were there to help the Haitian, to help Haiti further its revolution. 
But the issue and given land, given title, but the issue of, of, of becoming Haitian nationals, I never found in the literature. That is, what, once, once you arrive on the Haitian shores, are you now no longer an American, but now you are a Haitian because now that's your nation, that is the, your country that you've arrived upon. Therefore, you are a citizen and you have all rights to do all citizens of Haiti. Mm -hmm. That I did not find because they didn't stay, many of them that did not stay that long. And when they came back to the United States, they were still seen as, well, if I can use the word, seen as American. Um, I'm not sure if the people themselves saw themselves as Haitian, yeah. even if they had been granted Haitian citizenship. Mm -hmm. They just weren't there long enough to assimilate and to understand the culture, except for, though, of course, those who stayed. But for those who, who came in that first wave, or even that second wave, <clears throat> I don't think they were granted Haitian citizenship upon land disembarking from the ships. But once again, I cannot say that factually because I've not read anything to that to substantiate that. Okay. Um, now we have another question. It's kind. Of, it's all. It's close. It's a bit related to this thing, but it's a little bit more related to the African American involvement in the Haitian Revolution. Were there any African Americans involved in the Haitian Revolution at, at all? I, I think that's a question I could briefly ask okay. if you want me to. Yeah, go ahead, Ben. Okay, so we had some African Americans involved. It was mostly in kind of like a sort of support role, kind of a merchant kind of role, <clears throat> and all that stuff. We had a. A guy, like, for example, known as a uh, Pressport Bauer, basically, he was um, from Baltimore. He used to, he went to Haiti out of curiosity because he wanted to see what was going on about with this revolution that was going on. This was um, right after the um, Emancipation Decree and the uh, Racial Equality Decree in um, 1794. So it, he saw it as safe for him to go there, there and do business with these Haitian revolutionaries. He uh, set up a sort of a... Um, a business there in order to kind of facilitate trade between the U.S. and Haiti to help um, get the Haitian army gunpowder and access to weapons and all that stuff because the Haitian government, Toussaint's government in particular, was very dependent upon American guns and ammunition in order to arm itself and defend Haiti against um, the British and the Spanish. Um, this was, uh, however, often a very dangerous and thing to do because well what happened to Bridgeport Power is that he eventually um he eventually made a return trip to attempted to make a return trip to the United States his ship got caught by a British ship by a British war war galleon and he ended up being re-enslaved ended up being enslaved and he ended up um stuck in a Cuban plantation pretty much for the rest of his life so there were African-American participants in the Haitian Revolution, but getting there was a risk because there was a blockade going on. You had to deal with British and Spanish ships that generally just looked upon any African participant as just a runaway slave. So, so I hope that kind of covers your question. Uh, got anything to add to that, Dr. Cranston? No, I think you did it uh, <clears throat> there without question. <clears throat> Excuse me. There were individuals here in the states who were aware of the revolution. Um, James Wharton, for example, and and they yeah they were very very aware and they supported it as much as anyone could support the revolution who was free or slave in the states. But in terms of being able to actually participate in the revolution, I've not read of anyone who actually um, participated in the actual fighting. Now. You know, we had, we, had, we had discussed at one point what happens when the Haitians come to the United States and how that plays out in the States. And yes, you do have rebellions with, between, with, uh, with, with, with mil mil militia forces made up of, of African-American and Haitians. But on the opposite end, no, I've read nothing of, of Afri a large number of African-Americans participated in the Haitian Revolution. Okay. All right. So... Um we got um, close to um, four minutes left in this presentation. Do we have any last questions? Um, feel free to unmute your mic if you want to ask them just real quick. Well, 
if there are any questions that come up later on, definitely feel free um, to email us and we will get those questions answered. Um, oh, it looks like uh, we have one more. Um, where can I find more stories about the characters of the revolution? Ooh, okay. Um, okay, so um, uh, for a general history of the Haitian Revolution, you could um, start with, say, Black Jacobins or the Avengers of the New World. Um, those are um, two good starts <laughs> on any sort of study of the Haitian Revolution. It will just give you a general narrative of what happened, who are the main participants, and all that stuff. Um, for the story on Bridgeport Bauer, basically, I mentioned... I would recommend *The Common Wind* by uh, Julie Scott. That's the that has a lot of interesting stories about connections between between Haiti and the rest of the Atlantic world. How African Americans, how different groups of enslaved Black people, um, saw saw the revolution from the outside. How they eventually got word of the revolution, despite efforts by say white planters in order to suppress it and all that stuff. Stuff. So those are some very good starts. Um, feel free to email me if you want any more rec book recommendations and all that stuff. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ben. Thank you very much, Dr. Knight. Fantastic presentation. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, I do just have a few announcements before we uh, wrap up. So like I mentioned at the beginning, this is uh, the first lecture of 2021 that's a part of Dr. Knight's own lecture series. So each month on the third Sunday of the month, um, Dr. Knight will be giving a lecture um, similar to this with a Q&A session to follow. So I do want to invite you all and, and we'll send out more information about this soon. Um, I do wanna invite you all to Dr. Knight's next lecture which is happening on Sunday, February 21st. And the topic is gonna to be the Rwandan genocide. So very powerful topic. Um, Dr. Knight has done extensive research on this. And so we are very much looking forward to that conversation. And we do hope that you join us then as well. Another thing happening at Hammock this year, again, centering education as a part of our mission, is we will be also doing a scholar series, a scholar lecture series. So each month, again, we'll be inviting um, a scholar affiliated with Hammock to come and do a talk on various topics. Um, this month, January, we are starting out um, with the topic on maroon, um, I always mess up this word, epistemologies um, with Dr. Edward Davis. And that is gonna be happening on Saturday, January 30th from two to 3 p.m. So definitely if you're uh, free and available on um, that Saturday, again, January 30th from two to three, feel free to join us um, for that conversation. Uh, and we'd love to, love to hear from you, uh, any feedback about today and, and lectures in the future. Um, so again, thank you, Dr. Knight, fantastic lecture. Thank you, Ben, thank you. for uh, the Q&A. And thank you all for being here uh, this afternoon. Have a great day. Um, enjoy the rest of your Sunday and we will talk to you soon. Thank Have a good you. one. See ya. Bye-bye.